Hello, Vladimir. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Vladimir? Hello. Hello, hello. I was muted. Yes. Yes. So um, I think you can uh, put uh, your slide uh, or, um, because we see your um, screen. But we should not, we don't have to log out. All right. But if he started, uh, nobody know. The risk is that he started. He's coming back. He's coming back huh? Ah, perfect. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I, I hear you. Very good. What about my files? Should I uh, load it or you will load it or what? It's better if you load it so that you choose how to yes, change. Yes. But when I tried before, it said that it is not allowed. Okay, so let me try again. Now it is allowed. Don't see your slides yet. Uh, yes, I don't know what is happening. I, I followed the instructions, but somehow I don't see the file. Okay, resume sharing. Okay, resume sharing. And now, what's going on? I don't know. Yes, it's yes. a very standard procedure. Why it's not working? Yes. So can you um, uh, not very right, very right? The, the X, the, the top corner on the right. One second, let me see what you're saying. One second, because now it somehow stopped. The screen is not there anymore. I don't know what's going on. Um, what is going on? I don't know. Ah, yeah. Okay, view, full screen, okay. And now, now I should be able to, I should be able to, you know, to share the screen. Yes, okay, let's, let's hope. Let's open your file, please. Uh, yes, it is.
Do you see it now? Because I, now I see it on your screen. Do you see it, no. it now? Very good. Do you see, you see it now? Yes. Very good, we see now. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> yes, I don't know what was going on. Okay, so I, but now it is there, yes. Yes, so I'm um, very pleased uh, to start uh, this uh, afternoon session and uh, to introduce uh, Professor Dobrev that we talk about invariant differential operators and we'll give an overview on it. Please. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the topic invariant differential operators is something that is very important for physics, no, no doubt. Uh, this is the plan, I will give some introduction and then I will uh, make an overview of, of uh, various uh, applications and I will explain on the way the choice of these uh, algebras. Okay, so as I, as I said, it's, uh, for every physicist, it is very clear that this importance. Now, I have uh, uh, my own approach of the explicit construction of invariant differential operators. And there the building blocks are the uh, parabolic subgroups and subalgebras from which the necessary representations are in use. Now, of course, uh, the things are very complicated and in fact, you always have to go in, in detail. And that's why it is, uh, you have to discuss the groups uh, in a sense, or series of groups one by one. So as a natural choice, we started with non-compact groups that have discrete series representations. By the harris chandler criterion, these are groups where the rank of the group is equal to the rank of the maximal compact subgroup. Uh, okay, so as an example, the groups S U P Q, which everybody has used and knows, have discrete series except on, when both P and Q are odd numbers. In that case, relation one one is not fulfilled. This class is still rather big. So once to start with the subclass, name it the, the class of Hermitian symmetric spaces. But there is geometrical criterion, but the algebraic one is that the maximal compact subalgebra in this case has the form. It has one factor SO2 or U1 and uh, another compact factor as a direct sum. Now these Lie algebras from this class are SO2 the conformal uh, algebra in n dimensions, SP and R, SUMN, SO star 2N, E6, exceptional groups E6 minus 14. I'll explain later what this means, E7 minus 25. These groups have uh, highest, uh, besides having discrete series, they have highest and lowest weight representations, and then they will have uh, holomorphic discrete series, series representations. Of course, the most widely used is the conformal algebra, S12, in n dimensional Minkowski space time. In that case, there is a maximal Bourdieu decomposition, which I can explain uh, otherwise, but in this case, it has direct physical meaning, namely the first factor M is the Lorentz algebra of n dimensional Minkowski space time. The subalgebra A is uh, S11 and represents the dilatations. And then the two conjugated subalgebras are the algebras of translations and special conformal transformations, both, both, both being isomorphic to n dimensional Minkowski space time. Uh, now, as a, um, a keep of notation, the subalgebra of the first three factors or it may be the, the, the last one is exchanged. It's called maximal parabolic subalgebra. Maximal is when such a factor, the abelian one is one dimensional. 
Uh, there are other special features which are important in the conformal case. In particular, if you make the if you take the complexification of the maximum compact subgroup, it is as as more to the complexification of the first two factors that will brought the composition above. In particular, there is coincidence of the semi-simple subalgebras k prime, a factor of k, this first factor, and, uh, and m, the complexifications. This means that the sets of finite dimensional non-unitary representations of m, non-compact, are in one-to-one one, one -one correspondence with the finite dimensional unitary representation of k prime. This, uh, this is important for representation theory. Uh, now, uh, the, some of the Hermitian symmetric spaces share this the above mentioned special properties of the conformal. This class is the conformal itself, SPNR, SUNN, SO star 4N, and AE7 minus 25. And the corresponding analogs of Minkowski space time are RN minus 1, 1, uh, the symmetric uh, functions on NR. Hermitians, Hermitian with, uh, with, uh, octo uh, with Cortenias, and Hermitian three-dimensional with octonials. And these are the four uh, division algebras. In view of applications of physics, we propose to call these algebras conformally algebras groups. We have started the study of, in the framework of the present approach, uh, these uh, cases, uh, one of those cases. Later, we considered some algebras outside the above class, and furthermore, a case with some parabolics, Heisenberg parabolics, exceptional G22, and that's a star 2-1. Later, we discovered an efficient way to extend our consideration beyond this, because this, beyond this class, using the notion of parabolically related non-compact semi-simple algebras. So two Lie algebras are parabolically related. If they parabolic subalgebras after complexification coincide, and also the factor of M and the M coincide. Certainly there may be more than one such parabolic relation for any given algebra. And any two algebras may be parabolic related by different parabolic subalgebras. In the footnotes, I give some definite some uh, papers which you may look at. Now, with a formal one, I I am going now back to some very simple things which every physicist should know. Uh, in fact, of course, it will apply to SO four two in the beginning and with the Maxwell equations. So the Maxwell equation is usually written in this relativistic language way, but they can be also given non-relativistically in, uh, in this fashion. And where we use, uh, we can use this new, uh, new vectors f, fk plus minus, uh, which is really like this. This is important since uh, the, the showing how the, uh, the Maxwell equation, non relativistic actually splits into two subgroups. I'll explain this more later. And then what you maybe don't know is that the eight equations, which are here, may be written as two conjugate scalar equations in the following way. Well, we have the following notation. I plus is such a vector field, Z and Z bar complex coordinates, which, are, which have more meaning as I will show later. And, and X plus minus V and V bar are complex parametrization of Minkowski space time. And these are the corresponding uh, derivatives. And then in terms of this, of this all new, new, new notation, F plus minus Z and Z bar, the scalar function F plus 
in this vector field, uh, this uh, stuff. Uh, F by F minus is this, and J is this. So we translated uh, uh, the Maxwell into scalar functions, and uh, uh, the current, the current, the J mu current in such a scalar with Z and Z bar involved. Now, if once I have written uh, the Maxwell equations this form, how I go back, I just substitute all this there. And I see that their both sides are first order polynomials in the two variables in Z and Z bar. And comparing the independent terms in terms of Z, Z bar, we get the equation, the, the Maxwell equation in this static form. Okay, then you may ask, well, okay, if you rewrote them, who cares? The point is that writing the Maxwell equations in this simple form has important conceptual meaning. The point is that each of the two scalar operators, I plus minus, is indeed a single object. Maybe it is an intertwiner of a conformal group or conformal invariant differential operator, while the, all of the operators in the above formulas do not have this interpretation. Now, to be more explicit, we shall say, we shall recall that uh, the physical element representation in four dimensional conformal algebra may be labeled by these uh, three numbers, where the first two and one and two are non -negative, negative integers, fixing finite dimensional irreducible representation of the Lorentz algebra, dimension being this product, and this is the, this is the conformal dimension or energy. Then the intertwining properties of the operators are given like this. I plus is, is ascending from C plus to C zero, I minus, minus from C minus to C zero. And this is the what means intertwining. Uh, yes. And then the signatures are given like this X plus two zero two, X minus two, zero two three, and X zero one one three. In fact, when I, I recall that with respect to Lorentz, the representation then one and one is the four dimensional Lorentz representation of the current. And N1 and N2 are two conjugate three dimensional Lorentz representations carried by the two pieces of Maxwell, the F plus minus pieces. And the conformal dimensions are of the current T equal three and the Maxwell field D equal two. And now, we see that the variables Z and Z bar are related to the spins properties, and we call them spin variables. It's also important that the variables X plus minus BV bar combined to Z Z bar have definite group theoretical meaning. Namely, these are the six local coordinates on the corset SL4 uh, slash by uh, the Borel subgroup, which consists of all upper diagonal uh, matrices. And of course, this is a concept of the conformal group. Now, we recall, recall uh, that there, uh, that, uh, next to the current, there is a potential, which is again a, a vector, one, one, but the conformal dimension is one, it's well known. And then we have this relation, but not forget that the right hand side is only a subspace, not every, every F menu is, uh, can be made in this way. And then there are two more conformal operators, phi with all zero signatures, so the d mu phi projects into a mu, and d mu uh, j mu projects into, into the big phi, again, recalling that the right hand size are subspaces. All this we present in the following picture, which we shall generalize later. So this is the mu and the new, and these are the, the two operators acting two times for, with, together with a mu, j mu, and the two pieces of Maxwell uh, strength. 
So this is the simplest occurrence. Now there is a, there is a uh, there is additional group theoretical thing that uh, there is besides these differential operators which are here, each pair which is f which is plus minus in the above is conjugated but by some integral operators. These are Knappstein operators. Uh, they were introduced in Knappenstein in mathematical literature completely independently of physicists, which when they saw these integral operators, it immediately realized that the, the conformal current is the conformal to point function. So that's how mathematics and physics <laughs> uh, go in, in parallel. Now this picture is the simplest occurrence of four dimensional conformal invariant operator. The general case is given by a three par parameter generalization of the above picture given as above. This uh, uh, P nu and N are positive integers, which are exactly thinking labels of SL4. We shall call this uh, uh, multiplets. And if I substitute P nu N is equal one, I will immediately recover phi, phi big A mu J mu F plus minus. And now the multiplets, the sextets, are given in the following picture. Same picture, but now with general parameterization. And also this, the operators now are more complicated because they are for for arbitrary uh, representation. They are given explicitly like this. These are like this, and then they can be well written using sigma matrices and these vector fields. These are again sigma and epsilon is I sigma two. Uh, and you here have here this thing. So you see how one constructs a scalar operator of this vector field representations. Uh, yes, now one subtlety for I, I from polynomials in ZZ bar, I have passed to homogeneous polynomials in the, the variable Z1, Z2 of degree N1 and Z1 bar Z2 bar degree 2, degree N2. The two realizations are easily related that the former Z is this ratio and the former Z bar uh, is this ratio. The above picture is valid also for the four dimensional conformal algebra SO51. Actually, it was discovered first, first in the Euclidean case in this paper here from 1978. And it's also valid for SO33. Now, we all would like to have the generalization is of four dimensional. Now we shall speak about n dimensional. Uh, Minkowski space time and an analog of Lorentz, as I have. In fact, even more general, we can work with the SOPQ case immediately. Then the analog of Lorentz is this SOP minus one Q minus one. Minkowski space time is equal to, uh, to this uh, number at the dimension. And now the signature of this of SOPQ is given in this way, they are hash and uh, factors. H, sorry, H is the smallest integer, P plus Q minus two or two. And if P plus Q is even, these numbers N are related like this. The, so the first thing can be also negative, but they are ordered like this. And if P plus Q is odd, they are ordered uh, like this. And the last one, as I discussed, is already the character of A. Uh, now the why, uh, now we work with the parameter C, which is uh, related to the conformal weight in this way, because in that case, uh, the, the, the parameterization goes in these pairs, where these are the pairs related by the Knappstein uh, operator, so it is easier to write everything uh, with, with less writing. So this is the general P 
picture. Uh, and now, okay, I'll use here a, a formula which I derived for a multiplet uh, and the dimension of the multiplet, the number of representations is 2n plus h like this. And now I give the multiplets pictorially, first for p plus q even and then p plus q odd. Now for p plus q even, actually, of course, we see the, the familiar picture, which you already have, uh, starting from the conformal case and the maximal. Only this, the two legs are, and the two legs are uh, longer, but otherwise the, the picture, the structure is very similar. So this is for when P plus Q is even, as in the conformal case. If P plus Q is odd, I, and also here, I recall, always there the, the integral operators that go for plus, between plus and minus. When, when P plus Q is odd, picture is simpler. It doesn't have this structure in the middle. Uh, actually, uh, this, I, I retain the, this dot, which marks the Knapstein pairing of the representations. So this is for P plus Q uh, odd. And the, operate, the degrees of these operators in the two pictures are given in terms of these numbers, which are in the representation theory. So this is the overall uh, formula, only this should be omitted when purpose Q is even. And the pairs, I said, are related by Knapstein operators. Now there is a peculiarity when purpose Q is odd, because here we have the Knapstein operator from here to here, but we also have the differential uh, operator. So what happens is that the two point function, which is the Knapstein from here to here, because it's an integer point, it is a, a degenerated function, it's actually a generalized function. So one has to, to regularize it. And after regularization, this two point function degenerates to a differential operator, which actually is obtained in another way uh, by, uh, by this picture. Degener the degeneration actually was first given by Gelfand and Caitlin 60 years ago, more than 60 years ago. Okay. So uh, now the matters are arranged so that the top, the top representation in the picture, this or the other one also, contains find a dimensional unit, non-unitary sub-representation. And these are the only one that has finite dimensional representation. In fact, all finite dimensional are parameterized by these uh, integers. Uh, and also, uh, of course, uh, there is a big difference for the, for the, for the bottom representation because this, this uh, is, uh, depends on, on P and Q. On P and Q, for instance, if PQ uh, is even, which means that one of the numbers PQ must be even, dimensioned in the representation at the bottom is discrete series representations. Although there are other representations which contain discrete series. And if Q is equal to two, like the conformal case, the subspace, uh, this is the, the homomorphic, that is, is the sum of two representations, d plus d minus, which are called holomorphic and anti holomorphic discrete uh, series. And then there is, of course, the lowest weight generalized Perma module, which is equivalent to the holomorphic discrete series. And there is the conjugate highest weight generalized Perma module, which is equivalent to the anticholomorphic case. Now, above we restrict it to n to be bigger than two. The point is that uh, f for n equal two, the algebra S2 2 actually splits into two cases S1, 2. The case S1, 2 is also special and treated separately. In fact, it, was, it is contained in what we presented already. 
because the multiplets can tell us the two representations which are depicted by the, by the pair x1 prime plus minus. And they also have the properties that are described. And furthermore, this case is already first given in 1946, independent by Gelfand and coworkers and by Bargman. These are uh, references to this uh, very important papers. Okay, so we exhausted more or less the, K, the case as when two even as OPQ. And now we pass to the next, uh, to the next family, SO, SUNN. Uh, I put here, I'm not being only to two, but in fact, SO22 two, two case was already discovered above, because SO22 two, two is SO42. Okay, so in this case, this is the, the signature. We split the signature in two. This is the, the dimension related to the conformal weight. This is the Knappstein uh, the con conjugation. That's why this is split into two pieces. This is the, uh, the root system. Uh, and then if we, if we calculate how many representations do we need by the formula which I gave above, this time it is this 2n by n. And okay, the convention is that each, uh, that I'll give some, uh, Actually, I will explain it better on the picture itself. Of course, you see here that the number of presentations grows rather quickly. SU22, we have given. This is SU33. Now here, 1, 2, 3 is uh, giving the, uh, the parameters M1, N2, N3, N4, N5, which are the parameters which are used here. And uh, one, the, the indices here, two, three, one, three, are the roots which are explicitly given above. We shall not go into these details. So this is valid for SU33. And in fact, by the parabolic relation, it's also valid for, for SL6R. So this is SU33, SU44 is, is this rather complicated picture. You will understand why will I will not give you SU55. I cannot draw it on one sheet of paper. This thing is also valid for SL8R and SU star A. And the M factors are given uh, below. So we pass now to SPNR, and which also valid for SP n to n2 when n is uh, even. Uh, so again, the maximal compact splits in this special case. M is SLNR, and these are the present, uh, the numbers representations of SLNR. The, the conjugation, the Knappstein conjugation is given by this. Uh, and then of course we have the positive roots and the simple roots the Harris Chandra parameters, which I gave also before. Now the number of presentations here are two to the degree n. That's why you are able to give more representations for n equals three, three, four, five, six. Uh, the case is SL, SL, uh, n equal one, were already considered so P1 is SL2R and SP2 is SL32. Also the case SP11 was considered above because it is SO41 uh, in the Euclidean case in three dimensions. Okay, so because this is more simpler, I can give more representations. So this is SP3R. One may say it looks like SO62, but of course the ranks are different and the parameterizations is different. And it has uh, less parameters. So SP3 are very simple. SP4 is more complicated. It, it, it keeps this picture in the middle, but grows more and more complicated, like SP, SP5. SP5 have these two factors 
Oh, these are now two layers of representations, one over one, uh, SP5. And SP6 uh, is even more complicated. It has more, it has again, it has now more layers, it has a middle layer and also some more complicated picture, um, more layers, more representations. And that's the end of my ability to, to picture diagrams. So we pass to the SO star foreign. So this is a, an, an SO star foreign. Uh, it, uh, I'll let you know that uh, you have uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, to go and then there will be question time. Yes, of course, of course. I, I will, I think I will finish in this time. Uh, now, in this case, uh, the, the algebra M is as to start to end. We have this thing. Now we have this a special series. We have as to start for, for as to start eight, as to start 12. Now as, as to start, start four is as to three, as to one. So it was already discovered as to start eight is as to six, two. Um, and then we have as to start 12, which was not covered until now. Uh, so it has this, uh, these numbers, these numbers, uh, and then here are the 32, uh, uh, the number of presentations in the multiple 32, and is given explicitly like this. It looks like a little sp6, but it has uh, more complication in the, in the middle, but otherwise it is manageable. SO star 12, it's also SO6, SO66, same, same picture. Now we will pass to some, okay, the last of the conformal is SE7 minus 25. Now uh, the maximal compact is E6 and the factor M is E6 minus 26, which you can also discover separately by on its own, but here it is just the factor M in the subalgebras. Uh, and it's also valid for E77. This is the split form E7 with M factor E66. Uh, so here there are only 56 representations and the picture is like this. It looks similar to what we have before, but there are more layers, more complicated pictures above. Uh, actually, since this also have holomorphic discrete series, everything I was saying about SO42 and holomorphic also applies here. Always in these pictures, this has the bottom, the, 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 up, the top has the finite dimensional presentations and the bottom has the holomorphic discrete series. Now, there is the subalgebra, is the algebra E6 minus 14 related to E6, 6 and E6, 2. Here, the maximal compact is like this, so it's again Hermitian, and M is SU51, SU51. Uh, and this is the factors are SL6 and SU33. Uh, okay, so, this, uh, this is, uh, the, the, there are many, many details. It is a very rich structure here, which is completely given in this, in this publication, not very popular. And here, the, the representations. So this is difficult for the Hermitian case. Here we don't have a middle dot for the Knapstein and uh, uh, reflection symmetry, but we have, a middle, a middle line, and every two representations which are symmetric across this middle line are related by Knapstein operators. And not one more interesting feature is this, these two pairs, they are both Knapstein and differential operators. And then happens, happens what I described first for the SOPQ odd, SOP plus Q odd, that the, the Knapstein integral operator degenerates 
into a differential operator. So this is more different here in this case. Now, uh, one more algebra, simpler one. Um, uh, this is G22, which is say G2 is this the second rank complex algebra. G22 is uh, 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 real form. So the Val group is the dihedral group of four order 12. And the, there is a compact carton, which we can put in this way. The minimal parabolic, it looks like this, where now depends on which route you choose because G2 has long and short route. So there are two possible, uh, two possible choices of the factor M, whether there's the SL2 case is inheriting a long or a short route, but otherwise everything is the same. Uh, and yeah, so now I will uh, I will put the parameterization like this. It is only two 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 parameters. I first here this uh, additional complication that it is better to introduce to introduce also not only the maximum but the minimum parabolics. In that case, they're always the the isomorphic to the to the conjugate to the uh, dihedral value groups. This means it has 12 numbers. And this is like this. And the main multiplets are given like this explicitly. This gives us explicitly the vial group of the G2 and also give the parameterization of the 12 members of the multiplet. These are the main multiplets when inducing from the minimal parabolic. Uh, okay, here I will omit something which I actually also gave in the general case. They also apply here. Now, the induction for the maximum parabolic, it looks the same, but there are some restrictions because we are not allowed to take both numbers to be to be integer because then we'll go back to the minimal case. Even in general, uh, so if you take M1 not to be integer, we also have to, to take, of course, that M1 over uh, is not half integer. And then the, uh, the, the multiplet, which was 12 numbers, falls apart into, into six quartets, into three quartets three quartets. Uh, and now if we relax this condition, we allow M1 to be half integer, uh, then uh, the, the, la the last picture becomes like this, where this plus minus is as the Knappstein, and these are differential operators. This belongs to the next case, which I'll discuss, uh, where, which when P2 is maximal parabolic, it, it is similar, but the parameterization is different and different differential operators uh, enter over here. And here we can allow M2 to be uh, not, not one half. And the most interesting case here is when we allow M2 to be multiple of N, or N divided by three. In that case, the picture is becoming uh, more complicated. It unites two quartets in this uh, picture, where the Knappsteins now are going like this, also like this, also the degenerations and so on and so on. Maybe my time is up, um, so uh, I maybe I will skip uh, this the, the F2, the F4 algebras, and maybe I'll, I'll stop uh, here if we if we if the chairman says that it, I have to stop here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there questions, some comments? Question. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, hello. Uh, so suppose I'm interested in the of uh, 
No? Can, you be, can you talk louder, please? Suppose I'm interested in classification of conformal invariant operators in arbitrary dimension. So okay, okay. Uh, tensors, spin tensors of arbitrary type. So what is the exact reference and which year to look for it? Complete classification, not who is the first, who is the last, but complete classification. Uh, okay, so if you look at the, if you look at the Euclidean case, you can look in the first paper uh, in 78 with Petkova, if this is the, the Euclidean case. And then in the, in, in the conformal case, when there are some more subtleties, uh, maybe you should look, maybe let me, let me see what, if I have given the, the correct reference. There is of course my book with, but it's much later, of course, I have, Mm, other papers before that. Um, mm. Okay, uh, maybe if you look in this, uh, in one of these papers later, it's much later, of course, but the references uh, are given there because I, I maybe I didn't include them here. Let me see. Ah, and, and also here, if you look, uh, reviews matrices, uh, it has also HEPTH, which I have not given here. But if you look at it in, in this paper, you'll see much earlier references, which for some strange reason I have not given, I have not given here. But if you look, if you look, stay, look at this paper, you'll find everything there. Okay, thank you very much. Are there further comments or questions? So well, I understand that uh, you were going then to classify the F groups and also the D ones. Uh, now the 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 F groups, uh, some of them I have classified. Uh, some of them I have classified. For instance, uh, okay, let us see. Just a second. So this is. The, the split form f f four f four second is one of the split form of f, the split form of f four, and there is, uh, and also there is the the other one second, one second. Ah, I have also f f four prime, but I maybe I didn't include it in this paper in this exposition. There is also F4 prime. I'm sorry that I didn't include it in this exposition because there's a much more picture. And as of star, star 2n, I discussed those which are related to the conformal. And here, these are uh, those which are the extreme opposite. Uh, the extreme opposite in the following case, the maximal parabolic subalgebras of this algebra uh, are like this. So uh, if you take the case j equal one, it, it has the maximal uh, parabolic, which is called Heisenberg. And the n factor is, has Heisenberg pictures. And uh, in, in the previous case, when I considered S of star four n, I discussed the opposite case when g is equal to, to r. So here in this section, g j is equal to one, it, it's related to the conformal case. And when J is equal to R, it is Heisenberg, Heisenberg case, which also referred to, and since they are parabolically related, one can consider also the SOPQ, which I before in some other section considered on the conformal point of view. And here, this is from uh, when they have the Heisenberg uh, algebras. Uh, yeah, maybe these are some, some simple cases. S of star 10 is like here. Uh, yes. So you see, S of star 10, it is uh, when it's considered from the point of view of, of the Heisenberg, uh, it, it seems more complicated than S of star 12, which, which was considered from the conformal. 
uh, point of view. So it is, uh, yeah, this was the supposed end of my, <laughs> of my exposition. Thank you very much for the questions also. Great. Are there questions? So let's uh, thank the speaker again. Our next speaker is Gaetano Fiore. about uh, general all the equivalent fuzzy hyperspheres the confining potential and energy capos please Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's uh, nice to be here again. <clears throat> Sorry, oh, it's happening. Oh. Okay. Um, I think uh, everybody in this room has uh, some very good motivation for doing a uh, physics or non commutative spaces. Uh, I just have listed a few ones. Uh, the first motivation came from the first example of uh, an community spaces in uh, 47 by uh, Snyder uh, to avoid ultraviolet divergences in uh, quantum field theory. It is also um, uh, thought is, uh, it's useful for uh, formulation of quantum gravity compatible with the uh, limits to the localization of events. Uh, due to the Planck length, uh, or as an arena for a unifying uh, interaction. Uh, so it's uh, uh, interesting, irrelevant to ask uh, which, uh, given a quantum theory on a commutative space, uh, how to find possible non commutative candidates which approximate the original theory T. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I would like uh, to outline a, a very general mechanism which then I apply to um, uh, the fuzzy spheres, <coughs> which um, also includes a, a reduction of dimension. Uh, the mechanism is the following. Uh, if um, H is the Hilbert space of the system, A the other of observables on it, and uh, we consider a subspace, Hilbert subspace uh, H bar uh, and P bar its projection, then uh, by applying the projection to the um, operatory of the observables, one gets a new algebra, um, which whose elements um, may have very different commutation relations uh, from the original one. Because, uh, the, for instance, the projection of the commutator is by no means, in general, the uh, commutator of the projections. So, in particular, you can get non commutative coordinates. Uh, if the subspace is uh, preserved by the action of the Hamiltonian, so what physically means that uh, uh, from the, uh, by, by the time evolution, then uh, also the projector uh, is and uh, it commutes with the, the Hamiltonian. <laughs> and uh, in particular, this might be useful if uh, we take as a subspace 
and subspace um, characterized by having energy. So the spectrum of the Hamiltonian below a certain cutoff uh, E bar. And uh, then uh, G bar will be a low energy effective approximation of uh, the original theory. The prototype of this mechanism is a Landau model in uh, two dimension, <coughs> as we all know. So why this might be useful uh, in phenomenological, it might be useful uh, if uh, the complement, orthogonal complement to H bar is not uh, accessible um, in preparing the initial state, in uh, doing uh, interactions with the environment or the measurement apparatus. Uh, and then uh, T-bar can be used as an effective theory uh, for the original theory. But uh, it might be useful also um, if we, the original theory is expected not to work well uh, at uh, energy higher than E-bar because new physics uh, is expected then a T-bar may also have to figure out a new series of prime valid for all energies. Uh, I want to point out that uh, if uh, the Hamiltonian is invariant in the, some group G, then also uh, H-bar, T-bar, and T-bar will be. Uh, we can uh, apply this mechanism to um, quantum mechanics on uh, uh, the Euclidean space, for instance, uh, and we know from a basic uh, quantum mechanics system that the dimension of the projected field by space will be essentially the volume uh, uh, of the accessible region in phase space divided by uh, the power of uh, the Planck constant. So if uh, the uh, Hamiltonian only contains the kinetic energy, uh, we put a bound on the P, but not on the X and the volume uh, in phase space will remain infinite and so the dimension of the Hilbert space. But uh, if uh, there is, for instance, a confining potential also in the Hamiltonian, uh, then at least for uh, uh, low enough energies, the classical region uh, allowed by the condition E uh, less than E bar will, be, uh, will have a finite uh, volume and, and therefore the dimension of the uh, Hilbert space will be finite. Uh, we can um, uh, uh, we can uh, get a sort of dimensional reduction from uh, R D to a submanifold uh, by requiring that uh, the support that the uh, potential has a very very sharp minimum on a submanifold of R D, and uh, this is what I'm considering here with a, a sphere. So we take uh, the dimensional sphere. Uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, Francesco Pisacane, former student of mine. So uh, the potential depends just on the radial coordinates, and we requ require that uh, the minimum is at uh, r equals one, um, and uh, it grows uh, very sharply for uh, larger and smaller parts. Uh, <clears throat> then. Uh, in a neighborhood of the um, uh, sphere, uh, we can approximate, the idea is that we can approximate uh, the potential with uh, an harmonic one, sorry. Okay, an harmonic one. Um, and we can parameterize uh, this phenomenon to uh, the second derivative, which we call uh, K, for K, uh, we, which we assume to be very large. Um, so if we uh, take the cutoff uh, low enough, we can uh, eliminate the radial excitation from the spectrum. Uh, and uh, we obtain that the projected Hamiltonian essentially becomes the uh, uh, square angular momentum, namely uh, the, the Laplace on the quantum, on the sphere, on the uh, sphere. We also find that uh, the coordinates, um, the bar coordinates are uh, non commutative. Their commutator will be proportional to the uh, angular momentum, uh, as in Schneider non commutativity. Uh, this can be, I mean, the parameter E bar 
uh, and the k can be uh, discretized by the, a function of uh, a, a natural number lambda. Uh, and renaming h bar, p bar, and a bar as uh, h lambda, p lambda, a lambda, uh, we get a sequence of uh, Hilbert spaces and algebras, which uh, in the limit uh, lambda going uh, to infinity uh, goes to uh, the Hilbert space of of uh, zero spin particles on the one, on the sphere and the, the operators on the, on this feedback space. Uh, and the, these computation relations, the whole construction will be covariant under, uh, not only under SOD, but uh, also uh, under the full OD, so also inversion of the axis. This was done in detail uh, in dimension uh, small, the lowercase d one and two, and uh, started for a higher dimension in, in 2020. And uh, here I report on its completion via simplification of the formalist uh, in, in the uh, explicit uh, district description of the angular degrees of freedom through uh, polynomials in Cartesian coordinates rather than, than uh, through, in, uh, through spherical harmonics. And uh, I will compare at the end uh, uh, our passes here with other passes here. Uh, so after this introduction, this is a table of content. Uh, let me go to the uh, construction. So we will use real Cartesian coordinates. Uh, R square is obtained, the square distance from the origin is obtained in this way. And I mean, these are the basic tools of uh, quantum mechanics you teach at uh, the first year of, uh, uh, of, uh, of quantum mechanics student. Uh, so we use essentially the angular momentum components uh, in the sense of uh, the orbital ones. We have the standard commutation relation. And uh, as we know, it's convenient to solve the Schrodinger equation passing to uh, radial, uh, so to polar coordinates. So this is the Laplacian uh, in polar coordinates uh, as usual. And this is, uh, okay, the quadratic casting of USOD and the Laplacian of, uh, on the sphere. So uh, we do some transformation. We, we look for solution of the, uh, Schrodinger equation um, as a factorizing uh, the angular part and the radial part. Uh, the radial part, we, we do a, a little change of, uh, uh, of the independent function of the dependent function. And uh, the equation becomes uh, this one with the, only the second derivative, no first derivative. And then expanding the, the square bracket uh, at lowest order in R minus one we get uh, an auxiliary uh, Schrodinger equation in one dimension of the uh, one dimensional harmonic oscillator, uh, eight, which uh, approximates well uh, seven in uh, the spherical shell uh, VR less than E bar. And uh, we know how to solve it, of course, and uh, we, we plug the solution. Uh, the solutions are emit functions. Uh, the square interval solutions, and this uh, leads to uh, uh, radial functions f, which depend not only on the um, on the um, uh, eigenvalue of the angular of square angular momentum l, but also on uh, a radial quantum number, and we see that uh, uh, the energy. Uh, uh, it can be written in this way. And then we require, we, we fix the minimum of the energy requiring that uh, the lowest energy is zero. And we finally get with uh, this expression for the energy. So we see the, the blue part is the part which uh, we, we wanted, uh, the spectrum of the Laplacian on the sphere, namely of the angular momentum, square angular momentum. Whereas uh, this part, uh, diverges as k uh, goes to infinity. What uh, we want to do uh, in the large lambda limit to make uh, this uh, uh, potential 
uh, always uh, I mean, uh, sharper. Uh, so uh, we can uh, get rid of uh, these diverging terms by fixing the um, cutoff uh, so as to respect this uh, condition. We, we take it uh, um, as a, this function of the integral lambda of the natural lambda, lambda. and uh, so kappa will have to be with respect to this uh, inequality. Then automatically, the Hilbert space of the projective theory uh, decomposes into eigenspaces of, uh, uh, of L, L square, which means in practical uh, also of uh, H uh, in this way. Okay. And then uh, we have to, to find the commutation relations between uh, the coordinates, all the observables. We have to express the projector on this subspace in a, an explicit way. So if you have an orthonormal basis of the um, reducible, uh, of the reducible um, representation of, of uh, West so D with uh, this eigenvalue uh, L, I mean, the, the previous eigenvalue, this one, the blue one, uh, within uh, uh, the, the function, the uh, Functions on the sphere, so depending just on the uh, angles. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry. I, no. Yes. Uh, okay. The, then uh, the projector from uh, the Hilbert space uh, uh, of square integral function on the Euclidean space to this uh, Hilbert sub subspace. Uh, takes this form, but on functions with uh, which have dependence on uh, theta on the angles factorized uh, and also on radial coordinates factorized. Uh, this is uh, this uh, simplifies in that uh, essentially the uh, angular dependence is not uh, uh, changed by the action of this uh, projector, which. Uh, give zero if uh, j is different from l. Okay, so uh, the, the basic uh, progress of uh, our uh, construction and uh, the generalization for all uh, dimension is based on an explicit construction of uh, the, the involved representation of the orthogonal group by a polynomial in the coordinate x and in the, in the uh, coordinates x uh, evaluated at, at the sphere, which I call ti. Um, so we know that uh, polynomials uh, of um, homogeneous polynomials of degree L, um, sorry, I, uh, this uh, make up a subspace. Of the polynomial, the space of polynomials, which carries a, re a reducible representation of OD, uh, because um, uh, polynomials of degree L minus 2 times L square uh, carry, uh, carry smaller representation. So uh, the trace free component of VLD is, is the complement of this, and uh, uh, this allows to. Um, uh, find its dimension can be explicitly um, constructed in terms of uh, highest weights. Uh, possible choice of highest weights is uh, this uh, uh, x plus plus i uh, xk for any h and k uh, to the power l. Uh, <clears throat> or uh, as um, harmonic homogeneous, homogeneous uh, polynomials. Harmonic uh, in the sense that they are annihilated by the Laplacian. Uh, this <coughs> uh, subspace can also be uh, characterized by uh, trace free homogeneous polynomials, uh, which I'm going to, to con explicitly uh, write down uh, below using a completely symmetric trace free projector PL. Uh, the ti, uh, uh, the points, uh, the ti obtained dividing by the square root of uh, r, 
uh, fulfill the, this relation. So our, uh, the coordinates of points of the unit sphere. And uh, okay, you can introduce on the algebra of polynomials uh, in this PI uh, scalar product uh, as usual. Um, uh, uh, we call uh, the polynomials, the space of polynomials uh, up to degree lambda uh, in this way. Um, this can be obtained from the W lambda uh, before uh, by two of them, two consecutive uh, of them by dividing by, by the appropriate power of R. And uh, we end up with uh, this in uh, standard decomposition of uh, uh, these polynomials into irreducible components uh, under uh, West OD and OD. Um, uh, if we can, if we um, compute the dimension of this uh, subspace, we find that it's, uh, it's the same as the, uh, the dimension of uh, the reducible representation B lambda D plus one in uh, uh, one more uh, space dimension. And this will be very useful. Uh, <coughs> So uh, we can uh, construct, uh, as I said, we can construct um, reducible representation of OD uh, by a completely symmetric uh, trace free projectors. Uh, we call it uh, uh, if uh, pi uh, over E is the uh, fundamental d-dimensional uh, representation of US OD and OD, uh, the tensor product, um, the tensor product, sorry, um, decomposes uh, into representations as follows. So the antisymmetric part is uh, already irreducible, whereas the symmetric is not, uh, is reducible. Uh, so decomposes in a reducible part, which is the trace part, which is uh, uh, obtained um, applying the, this projector, uh, which uses uh, the metric, which uh, here is just uh, the Kronecker delta. And then the, uh, the remaining part is uh, the uh, trace-free symmetric projector uh, acting on A tensor, uh, on E tensor E, which is as this dimensional. So uh, it can be obtained from the symmetric projector uh, subtracting uh, this uh, uh, trace part, a uh, trace projector. By construction, uh, this uh, P fulfills uh, these relations, these and these, which more explicitly uh, read in this way. So if you contract any two indices, low or down with uh, the metric, you obtain the zero. So, um, the generalization to the uh, L, the tensor power uh, L of uh, E uh, of such uh, uh, trace free completely symmetric projector is determined by uh, the analogous condition. Here, uh, these are uh, projectors which act non trivially only on the N and the N plus one uh, tensor factor. Um, and which and, uh, these second conditions more explicitly read in this way. So the, the first uh, progress, uh, um, concrete progress uh, of, of our work consists in the construction of such a projector uh, in a recursive way. So in uh, the projector on the L plus one tensor factor uh, can be obtained by the, the L one uh, sandwiching uh, a matrix um, uh, acting on a on e tensor e um, in this way. So <clears throat> in this matrix uh, depends on the dimension and on L and this uh, this one. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, yeah. 
so the homogeneous uh, polynomials, uh, well, I should say the uh, trace free homogeneous polynomials xi1l defined in this way are harmonic and are eigenvectors of, of uh, L square R uh, we wish with uh, the desired uh, eigen uh, value. They make a complete set in the BLD as I had uh, announced. Uh, but they are not a basis because they are not uh, independent. They are, uh, uh, full, they are symmetric under permutation of indices and fulfill this really. So uh, now we can uh, see how uh, the uh, angular ornament components act on these uh, polynomials in, in this way. And uh, also the, uh, the multiplication by x act on this way. But uh, this has immediate uh, consequences on uh, 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 the, the polynomials which are obtained uh, dividing uh, the capital X by RL, which are uh, the same projection, projections of the new variables T, lowercase t, which make a, a complete set in VLT. Uh, so uh, again, these are eigenfunctions of L square with the same eigenvalue. Uh, LA, the angular momentum components act in a, uh, the same way as the X. Now, uh, the multiplication by uh, the lowercase t uh, takes this form. So as we expect, uh, multiplying an L tensor by a t, uh, lowercase t, I get an element in L plus one and L minus one. Uh, tensor. I mean, uh, L plus one, L minus one component. Um, now we embed the RD in RD plus one. I abbreviate uh, capital D equals to D plus one. Uh, and uh, to avoid confusion, I in dimension capital D, I add the subscript to distinguish uh, the objects uh, from their uh, counterparts in dimension D. So for instance, R capital D uh, is not uh, uh, R. Uh, and I use um, uppercase indices to, uh, for, for the coordinates of RD. Uh, I can, uh, in this way, I can embed naturally uh, polynomials in uh, the first coordinates into the, uh, the algebra of polynomials in the second uh, uh, the second coordinates, the coordinates of our D plus one. Uh, and we can also embed the naturally, naturally OD in, into S or capital D by identifying OD as a, as a little group of the uh, this uh, axis, the, of the last axis. Uh, it's Lie algebra is, uh, is uh, generated by the LHS or spanned even by the LHS. Uh, now, if we apply the same construction as before uh, in this new dimension, so we have the, this uh, projection, uh, projections in uh, one uh, more uh, spatial dimension, um, uh, we have, <coughs> we ask uh, what is the decomposition of uh, this, uh, uh, irreducible representation of S O D or uh, S O capital D into reducible representation of O D, and uh, the answer is uh, easy. If you apply the uh, previous, I mean, uh, projector, uh, the one in dimension D, to these objects, uh, so to L uh, legs of these objects, keeping uh, the remaining one. Uh, uh, taking the remaining one equal to capital D, then uh, what you obtain is a factorization uh, of these objects into uh, the previous uh, TIL and a polynomial in the capital, uh, in T capital D, this one. And uh, uh, these objects, um, um, span the, uh, components, the comp oh my, sorry, I am not good. Uh, the reducible components of uh, V lambda capital D under 
USOD and uh, also under OD. <clears throat> Well, uh, okay, then uh, you obtain applying the same rule as before, you, you obtain how, how these objects uh, transform under LHK under SOD exactly as a T, and also as uh, these new generators, the LH capital D uh, in, in this way. Okay, now armed with uh, these weapons, we, um, uh, we find the explicit action of uh, uh, these uh, projected uh, observables on uh, the projected Hilbert space. Uh, and we find that uh, the LHK act on the, this uh, CI, so the, the, the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian will be of this form, the T times the uh, function FL of R, which um, we have found before, which solves uh, the uh, ordinary differential equation uh, um, seven or eight, uh, which I wrote before. Um, and uh, the angular momentum component uh, acts in uh, the expected way. The XI, the bar XI, acting in this way, uh, okay, this, uh, the, the change with respect to the undeformed theory stays in this uh, coefficient uh, CL, and we recover the classical uh, coefficients in the limit K going to infinity when uh, this uh, CL uh, become zero. Um, now, these results are up to corrections in, uh, in uh, one over K, but uh, uh, these corrections depend on the, uh, all the powers in the entire expansion of V. We uh, assume we can uh, uh, choose this uh, expansion so as to uh, make uh, these relations exact. So this will be our definition of uh, this um, bar L and bar X in the uh, fuzzy case. Uh, then, okay, one can ask which relation do these uh, objects satisfy? So the black ones are exactly uh, as they in the, uh, the form case and are also proved in the same way. Uh, the red ones are new, in particular, you see this commutator is not zero and uh, as announced, it's proportional to the uh, angular momentum component, uh, like in Snyder non-commutativity. Moreover, we find that the square uh, distance from the origin is um, uh, not uh, strictly equals to one, but it's a function of a square angular momentum, which however, has uh, almost all eigenvalues very close to one and going uh, uh, to one in the limit k going uh, to infinity or equivalently, lambda going uh, to infinity. This uh, generalizes some uh, previous results of that. Uh, okay, these relations are not very illuminating because they are very complicated. Um, but uh, it, uh, okay, these are some, uh, some uh, observations. Uh, the order monomials in X and uh, capital in bar X and bar L make, uh, make up the basis of the algebra of observables. But as generators, we can use just uh, the coordinates because the angular momentum components can be obtained from the coordinates uh, through commutators. So, um, okay. I was saying, as I was saying, uh, these relations are very not uh, are not very illuminating uh, for the structure of the algebra of observables. Now uh, it turns out that uh, this is this is, can be characterized in a very uh, clean and simple way. Uh, let me first introduce this, this is square root of uh, uh, this function of, of L square. Uh, so that uh, uh, all eigenspaces of a square are also eigenspaces of a lambda uh, with the eigenvalue L. So the, 
important result is that uh, um, there is a, a an OG module isomorphism uh, from uh, our Ibex space to V lambda capital D and uh, an OG equivalent algebra map from the algebra of observables to uh, the irreducible representation of USO capital D on uh, lambda D. This, um, uh, such that uh, the two are compatible with each other. Explicitly, uh, this uh, act as follows on, on, on the, uh, these elements generating the Hilbert space and on uh, the, the, these elements generating the algebra of several. So essentially, uh, if we drop uh, the representation symbol, uh, this is the same. Uh, uh, lambda bar are the same as uh, uh, L bar as the same as the L, whereas uh, the X bar are obtained from uh, the, the new uh, angular momentum components by sandwiching them uh, with a, a, a function of the square angular momentum, which takes uh, this form. So here, so essentially, uh, you can see. X bar as uh, quite complicated uh, uh, functions of the algebra momentum, uh, 57, and that's all. Uh, the group of uh, star automorphisms uh, of the algebra of observables, as we know, if we call n the dimension of this algebra, yes, is uh, SUN, and we can uh, identify the inside the SUN uh, a subgroup. Uh, isomorphic to SOD acting via the, the n dimensional represent, reducible representation we have just uh, constructed. Uh, so it contains both uh, rotation in um, RD, in the Euclidean space, and uh, uh, transformations, orthogonal transformations, which have a uh, uh, determinant minus one. Uh, for instance, in, uh, inversion of uh, one or more axis and parity. Uh, one, uh, another important uh, uh, result is uh, um, to, to see a lambda as a fuzzy quantization of a, a appropriate conjoint orbit of uh, uh, o, o capital D. Uh, we recall that uh, if G for simplicity is a compact semi simple D group and um, uh, and uh, lambda is um, an element in the dual space of the its Lie algebra. We uh, uh, can define a conjoint orbit or o lambda uh, in the following way as a coset G over G lambda, where G lambda is the stabilizer of uh, uh, lambda inside the group uh, after identifying uh, G star and G uh, via the killing form. Clearly, uh, if we multiply uh, a lambda by, uh, by a number, capital lambda, uh, the stabilizer remains the same. Uh, and uh, if one takes you know, one way to, to uh, I mean, one particular uh, lowercase lambda uh, is the um, uh, highest weight of uh, an irreducible representation of our group. So we will uh, take, um, uh, we will define uh, a lambda as the endomorphism of the carrier space of the, uh, characterized by the weight, oh, sorry, by this weight, sorry. Ah. I'm not good there. Okay. This uh, rescaled weight, in particular, uh, um, I, uh, 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 this can be regarded as the sequence of such an uh, algebra with the lambda in N can be seen as a fuzzy quanti uh, quantization of the symplectic uh, space or, or lambda. So uh, if we apply this idea to SO capital D, choosing a fastant subalgebra H uh, as uh, General spans by these um, uh, components of the angular momentum. 
uh, and as highest weight we take vector we take uh, this uh, here uh, this is a highest weight uh, vector of uh, for uh, the representation v lambda capital d which is isomorphic to h lambda um, uh, as we have just uh, shown uh, in the previous theorem then uh, uh, the associated, uh, associated weight, namely the joint spectrum of uh, this uh, uh, and sigma uh, of, of the chosen uh, Cartan algebra element, is uh, a multiple of, of this one. And uh, identifying uh, uh, G H with H star to uh, the killing form, we find that at the end that the um, stabilizer. Um, of uh, H sigma, which I, I remember is uh, was just uh, uh, H sigma is this one. So it's the last uh, angular momentum component, the new one, so to say. Uh, the stabilizer is SO2 times SO uh, lowercase t, uh, where SO2 is, is generated by the uh, L, LDD, LDD, well, I didn't uh, by, by H sigma LDD, whereas SOD by the LIJ with IJ uh, smaller than capital D. And so Olanda is uh, this uh, coset. And uh, if you uh, compute the dimension, you find the two, D, two uh, lowercase d, which is exactly the dimension of the cotangent space of the uh, sphere, uh, the classical space, space of the sphere. So this is consistent with interpreting a lambda as the algebra of observables, quantized space space on the quasi sphere, and uh, is not uh, in general is not so if you take uh, other uh, generic uh, irreducible representations of USOD. You will if you do you will get uh, some different uh, equivalent bundle of USOD, uh, different from other uh, cotangent space. So. Um, the final, uh, uh, finally, let me uh, discuss uh, time. Uh, it, so. Okay, so maybe, maybe, okay, I stop here and I answer a question. If, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so we have uh, uh, built uh, a fuzzy version of a uh, uh, sphere, which is a fully or decovariant, uh, it decomposes um, uh, in this way under uh, OD in the, into reducible components uh, uh, of uh, OD. And uh, we see that this means that uh, as lambda goes to infinity, this becomes the decompositions of uh, uh, the, the algebra of function on, on uh, the sphere, of square interval of function on the sphere. Well, the same could be done for the algebra of function on the sphere seen as a, a multiplicative operators acting on L2ST, but uh, I have uh, no time to do this. So, <clears throat> um, uh, this is not so in. Um, in other uh, fuzzy spheres which have been considered uh, in the literature. Um, the Mador Hopper fuzzy sphere, which is the seminal uh, one and the simplest one, has a very nice uh, property that the, the X generate uh, a, a, the algebra uh, alone and the, 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 um, and, um, a subspace of um, uh, Harmonic, um, spherical harmonics is consists only of uh, uh, of products of the X. This is not uh, the case for our uh, fuzzy sphere or for other fuzzy spheres in uh, higher dimension. But uh, uh, the commutation relation of uh, Mador Hopper fuzzy sphere is not invariant under parity, uh, and uh, the representation space uh, is uh, essentially a VL3, does not uh, go to L2 S2 uh, as uh, in our case. 
uh, and uh, I mean, other fuzzy spheres in uh, more dimensions uh, have been constructed by Gross, Klimchitz, Schneider, Angulan, Dolan, Kohn, uh, which are based on a irreducible representation of both USO capital D and USO D. Uh, as being a, in a reducible representation of USOD, you have that uh, uh, both the, these two are um, customers and also the square distance from the origin uh, is the same, so it's a customer, it can be set to one. Uh, whereas this is not the case uh, in our construction. And uh, okay, and then in uh, Steinek uh, uh, and um, uh, a collaborator's construction. Uh, there is a, a generalization in our sense. Uh, the, the representation is uh, reducible as a reducible of US of six, but uh, reducible of uh, US of five and uh, of uh, five. Uh, the spectrum is not strictly one, but very close to one if one chooses uh, the weight of the representation in appropriate uh, manner. And, uh, but again, the decomposition of this uh, space into reducible components of USOD uh, uh, has not uh, the, the limit where we, we wanted. I mean, there's one of uh, square integral functions on uh, the sphere. So. Thank you. So I've taken. Question for, time for one question, uh, please. Oh, okay, um, so to some extent you have now anyway tried to address it, but it seems to me what you have constructed is precisely what people call higher dimensional fuzzy spheres. And of course, it's just the theory of quantized quadrant orbit. So any quantized quadrant orbit over the group is some bundle, equivalent bundle over the base manifold, and there are all kinds of realizations, sure. Um, but I, I really don't see the but uh, this is the only one with the correct dimension. I mean, uh, the dimension of the cotangent space. Yeah, if you want that, okay. But if, so, so these bundles, they can have all kinds of different dimensions. Some are smaller, some are larger than the cotangent space and so on, sure. So you have picked one where, they, where you recover the phase space, okay. But in principle, all these constructions, I think, are, are just group theory and this in principle, you know, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, the point is that there are many such representation and yeah, this exactly, is a, yeah. one which uh, has the correct classical limit yeah, in yeah. my opinion. Uh, exactly. So the point is the geometry is always some equivalent bundle over the sea. I think we, we agree on that, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so let's uh, thank you again, Dimitrika. come uh, to the last speaker of uh, the day and uh, of the conference, Leonardo Castellani, that uh, will tell us Non-commutative Hamiltonian formalism for non-commutative gravity. Okay, uh, I thank the organizers for their kind invitation to this conference. And uh, this is what I would like to talk about. Maybe. Uh, non-commutative Hamiltonian treatment 
for non-commutative gravity, but in general, non-commutative geometric theories. And we will see what I mean by geometric theories. Oh, which one then I should use? Top one, the pointer? Right? Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. But, uh, somehow. Okay. Now, here, uh, two ideas or two frameworks are put together in this talk. Uh, Hamiltonian methods and non-commutative geometry. Of course, both have a long history in uh, theoretical and mathematical physics. And in fact, they were brought together already uh, almost 100 years ago by Dirac when he considered the quantization of phase space, or quantum phase space in 1925. And after that, of course, many developments have taken place. Now in this talk, what I want to present is a Hamiltonian formalism, which is tailored for geometric theories and also for an extension of these geometric theories to geometric twisted theories in the sense of a Drinfeld twist, in the sense of a deformed wedge product, okay, star wedge product, which reduces to usual star product if the forms are zero forms. And uh, throughout the talk, I will treat only a billion twists, which give rise to a star exterior product. Uh, not really a billion twists, but twists that satisfy three very uh, intuitive properties that I will uh, now speak about. And these properties are satisfied by the, an abelian twist. Now, the logic of the talk is the following. Uh, when you start from, okay, from classical gravity, I write it in the form language, uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action uh, written uh, with curvature wedge uh, Philbein wedge Philbein. Uh, here, the Hamiltonian treatment, you can do it in components and it's rather heavy. Uh, what has been done by uh, Regge and collaborators more than uh, 30 years ago, in the 80s, in fact, was to uh, propose a covariant Hamiltonian treatment. And this I will briefly uh, remind, which leads to a Poisson brackets and uh, afterwards has been extended to treat also canonical transformations, symmetry generators, and uh, neuter theorems that stem from this framework. Uh, and this has been done more recently by uh, Dabda and myself. Now, this whole program, which I will briefly recall, can be somewhat twisted and uh, by the introduction of a star wedge product. And there you can perform uh, the same logical steps, uh, star Legendre transformation that brings you to star momenta and you have and everything with a star, Hamiltonian Poisson bracket, canonical transformation, so on. This theory here has been uh, developed by Paolo Ascheri and myself uh, more than 10 years ago. Now, as I was saying, the product that uh, I will use in these uh, uh, field theories, geometric field theories, is a generalization of the moyal grunewald product that uh, has been already discussed by many colleagues in this uh, Congress. And the generalization is provided by an abelian twist where we have a collection of uh, vector fields XA with these components that are commuting. And this is why it is called abelian twist. 
And then uh, you have the definition of star product induced by this abelian twist, which mimics the one by Grunewald, Moyal, Weil product. The extension to P-form is straightforward. You just need to uh, use lead derivative instead of tangent vector. Now, the three properties I was mentioning before are, are simply this one. And I mean, it has to have compatibility with the exterior derivative, compatibility in the sense of the Leibniz rule, graded cyclicity of the integral. And this is something that an abelian twist satisfies. Non abelian twist, on the contrary, do not satisfy it. Yes. Yes. No, it's uh, slightly more because you see now what we have here is in fact a Poisson tensor that really depends on X. It depends on X in a very peculiar way, but uh, still it depends on X. And the whole thing, then you can see it as a quantization of a Poisson structure where this is uh, the semi-classical part. Uh, yes, you could, but you see, for example, the range of these indices does not need to be from one to four. These, uh, these tangent vectors are not necessarily four tangent vectors. It can be less. So, it's so not clear that you can mimic it with a change of coordinates. But anyhow, if one wishes, you can just take the, the moyal by uh, usual product. It's not, uh, this is, the, the main message is that the star product has to satisfy this. Once it satisfies this, the whole discussion goes through, okay? So you can just choose the one that you prefer, provided you have graded cyclicity, Leibniz rule, and complex conjugation. Okay, so to say it in uh, pictures, what I would like to do is to take Mr. Sir Hamilton and to, yes, and to put a star here. Star Hamilton. Okay, the index, the menu is, is this, and I will briefly review the covariant Hamiltonian formalism as I was saying, then I will, uh, extend it to non-commutative case, and then I will apply it for gravity, okay? Non-commutative gravity. Uh, these are uh, some references on the covariant Hamiltonian formalism on non-commutative Firbein gravity introduced in, this, in these papers, and then uh, studied with the cyber written map in these other papers. A recent review can be found uh, on the archive. And uh, the content of this talk is in this uh, recent preprint. Now, the language of differential forms suggests a covariant way of introducing momenta and uh, Hamiltonian and uh, one considers actions as integral of D forms. Forms are multiplied when not indicated explicitly, they are always multiplied by a wedge product. Now, how do you uh, introduce this formalism, this Hamiltonian formalism? Well, uh, the fact is, as I was saying here, that in geometric theories, derivatives only appear via the exterior derivative. So it makes sense to define momenta as derivative of the Lagrangian, which is a D form with respect to the exterior derivative of the field, instead of the time derivative choosing a particular direction that labels time. And this you can do, and it is suggested also by the variational principle. If you write the action like uh, integral of this D form, 
the variational principle, well, you can write it like this. You have variations of the fields and then the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to these uh, P-form fields, this phi i can be P-form, higher degree form, not only one degree or zero degree forms. And then uh, you have to be careful of how, how you define this uh, right derivative here. You just have to commute the field that you want to vary throughout the Lagrangian. You, co you commute it to the left, taking into account the gradings of the forms that you are jumping on. And, uh, and then you vary the field. And this gives you the variation due to phi i, and then you have a variation due to d phi i that you can integrate by, by parts. You integrate by parts, and then you factorize the arbitrary variation, and you are left with the Euler-Lagrange form variation uh, equations of motion. Now this takes care of the gradings of the of the grading of the form phi i. Okay, so this is very general. And uh, the only subtle thing is the definition of these derivatives. All these products are wedge products inside. Now, this, you see, really suggests the definition of momenta as a derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the exterior derivatives of the fields. And this is how we define them. Now, if you take into account that phi is a P form, D phi is a P plus one form, then the, these uh, momenta will be D, which is the degree of L, minus P minus one form. No, it is not. It is, uh, it, it is different. It is not equivalent. Now, the form Hamiltonian you defined again as a D form, which is made out of PQ dot minus L, right? Now, the Q dot is this uh, exterior derivative of the basic fields. The, the pi are the, the momenta defined by this uh, definition here, and you subtract the Lagrangian D form, and this is a D form. You can prove that it depends only on phi and on pi uh, with exactly the same argument you use in textbooks for uh, usual Hamiltonian formalism. And then uh, by varying, uh, you can rewrite the action in Hamiltonian variables and varying with respect to phi and to pi and you find the Hamilton equations. You can even prove that these are equivalent to the euler lagrange equations directly without variational principles, but you can do it. These are all the gradings taken into account. And so these are the form Hamilton equations, okay? Everything is covariant. There is no time direction chosen. Uh, a form bracket is suggested by the on-shell differential that you can write like this. The differential uh, follows rules very similar of the variational rules that we used in the variation of the, of the action. And uh, then you see that this form bracket, uh, Poisson bracket, if A and B are the entries, is a degree of A plus degree of B minus D plus one form. In particular, we, you retrieve the canonical relation between fields and uh, momenta. All of these things are, are forms. This is a P form. The momenta is a D minus P minus one form. And if you plug this here, you find a zero form that is the delta, Kronecker delta, if these are the generalized indices labeling your collection of fields. Okay, these Poisson brackets have some properties that, uh, that are the analog of the classical properties of the usual Poisson bracket, but I will not. Uh, I will skip these technical details. Now, everything can be applied as an example. The simplest example of a, of a geometrical theory is, of course, gravity in, in four dimensions. And then you perform all the operations that I described in the, in the preceding transparencies. You take the Lagrangian. This is the definition of curvature in terms of a spin connection 
And uh, so this is first order formalism. You have spin connection omega and the Firbein V. D omega minus omega omega is the, the, the Riemann curvature, two form. And then you have uh, two form momenta because D minus P minus one in this case is equal to two since the fields are one forms, omega is a one form, V is a one form, the momenta are two forms. And these are the definition of the momenta. Now, uh, experts on Dirac formalism of constrained Hamiltonian systems recognize immediately uh, constraints because these involve only the canonical variables and not the velocities, that is the exterior derivative of the field. And so these are primary constraints, uh, which I indicate with the letter phi big uh, capital phi okay you can write the hamiltonian pq dot minus l i'm writing the canonical hamiltonian and uh, i can uh, write it in terms of the constraints like this then i have the hamilton equations and uh, velocities are undetermined as it happens in constrained hamiltonian systems when you have the primary constraints uh, if you use the constraints in the Hamilton equations of the first of the preceding transparency, you find the Einstein equation. This is just the Einstein equation. If you expand it into a basis of field binds, you find really Einstein tensor equal to zero. And then you have the torsion equation that tells you, if you expand it again you know, on a basis of field binds, you find that this tells you that you have zero torsion. So this is uh, a the theory of uh, Einstein Hilbert, where the equations of motion are zero torsion and uh, the Einstein equations. Okay? Zero torsion means that you can express the spin connection in terms of the Firbein and inverse, the inverse Firbein and derivative of the Firbein. Okay, so this is uh, then you can recognize that the algebra of constraint uh, is such that there are first class and second class constraints, but this I will not uh, uh, delve on since I'm not using it now. This was just to remind you, yes. No, by equation of motion. Okay, variational equation of motion. It's a Hamilton equation of motion that you implement on in which you implement the constraints. It's a time I'm not taking any slice at the moment. Yes. This is not a time slice. There is no time chosen. The constraints are constraints between forms. Yeah, D form. The action is the integral of a D form on a D dimensional manifold. Okay. The action is this one. Here you plug in the D form and here you take a four dimensional. Yes. There are no ternary constraints. Uh, okay. There are no ternary constraints. Uh, in this formalism, in the usual formalism, the component formalism, there may be ternary constraints, uh, but there are none, as far as I remember, in the first order formulation of uh, Einstein gravity. There are only secondary constraints, actually. But in this kind of geometric theories, there will be no ternary constraints ever because d square equals zero. As you will see later on, this is a consequence of this geometrical formalism, okay? Beware that this Hamiltonian treatment is not equivalent to the usual Hamiltonian treatment. Now, I can uh, introduce infinitesimal canonical transformations in the usual way. I'm using the Poisson bracket, but now it is the form Poisson bracket. I plug in a generator G, a would-be generator G, which has to be a D minus one form because 
in this way and only if it is a d minus one form, this bracket has the same degree of this A. A bracket G has the degree of A only if G is a D minus one form. Yes. Yes. Uh, I will try to answer such questions at the end, okay? Because the same question can be asked for gravity. Yes. Uh, I haven't done it for, for uh, young Mills. Because of one little technical issue, I have to understand how to treat the Hodge dual in this, uh, in this language. Since to write it in a geometrical way, I should write it as F wedge uh, Hodge dual of F, okay? No, it's, it would not be a priority problem, but uh, I still have to do it. Uh, I don't know what, if by quotization you mean to deform it with the star product, I think it will be clear. Uh, if by quantization you mean using this canonical formalism to uh, perform uh, the usual program of canonical quantization, I still don't know the answer because I haven't done it. But I agree that one can, uh, can think about it. So far, there is only five So far, no. So far, this is all, all classic, huh? Okay, so fine, you have the analog of uh, canonical transformations, you have the analog of uh, canonical global transformations, and uh, you do a little exercise and, and you will uh, retrieve in the form language, the theorem, the first Noether theorem for uh, global uh, invar uh, invariances. So G will be a generator of a symmetry, a global symmetry if it uh, commutes in the sense of form Poisson brackets now, it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay, so, and then if you have this, then if you use Hamilton equations, then on shell, on shell, you have a conserved quantity, which will be the integral of this generator on now you can introduce a slice so that you will have conservation on the parameter that parameterizes the orthogonal direction to the slice. And this, if you wish, you, you can call time. But all of this, you do not have to introduce it. I mean, just if you want a conservation law in a particular direction. Now, local transformations, then. Uh, in general, I have these uh, local transformations in field theory with gauge symmetries uh, usually have parameters and derivatives of the parameters inside. If there are ternary constraints, you would have also second derivatives of, of the parameter. But as you see uh, here, you cannot have second derivatives of parameters because the most that you can do with the derivation pro operator is, is to take the exterior derivative. And this, you can do it only once. Uh, so for canonical local transformations, you have to consider this sort of generators. And if you plug in and you vary the action and so on, you find the conditions for these F and G that are part of a symmetry generator. This is uh, this just, retraces the steps of an old algorithm that was introduced many years ago that enables you to find these chains that uh, build up uh, gauge generators in theories that have invariant local invariances. Here it is rephrased in the language of differential forms of, of, uh, of forms. And what you find are these two conditions that is this F this G must be uh, the commutator of H with F in the sense of form Poisson bracket, brackets up to primary constraints. 
and uh, G itself must commute with H. And then this thing vanishes and uh, the action is invariant. Okay. This provides you with, uh, with an algorithm to find these things. And you can do the exercise for uh, D equal for field bind gravity. And you start with an F. That is, you take these pi AB that are first class quantities and uh, you commute them with the Hamiltonian and you get the G, you add it here. And uh, here you find the reconstruction of this generator, which if you plug it in the, in the Poisson brackets, reproduces exactly the Lorentz transformations, the local Lorentz transformations that are invariances of the action. So we have checked here that the algorithm works in this very simple case. Now, this whole discussion will be extended now to the non-covariant setting, okay? So, so it is now that, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I should call it H bar, but the uh, deformation parameter enters the game. So now you have geometric theories where the Lagrangian is still deformed. You have still these fields with exterior derivatives, but now, all the, all the forms present in the Lagrangian are multiplied by a wedge star product in the sense of twisted, Greenfeld twisted star product with, which satisfies the three properties I said before. Now, the variational principle, you can reformulate it as before, but now you must be careful. Uh, we know that this integral is cyclic, so we can use cyclicity. So what I will do for the variation is first to cyclic reorder the Lagrangian and putting the field that I want to vary in front to the left, okay? So now this derivative here is a right derivative, but with the proviso that it, the Lagrangian is reordered cyclically in order to preserve the cyclic, uh, to, 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 to use the cyclic property of the integral. It's cyclically reordered to the left and then it is varied, okay? So this is then a correct formula. Provided these derivatives with respect to the basic fields are defined into this cyclic way. Before, in the classical case, it would not matter how you would commute the field. Now you have to bring it to the front the cyclic reordering, not with any reordering that just takes into account the gradings and that's all. Okay, so once you do this, you, you find that you can again factorize this variation here, delta phi, and you have these Euler-Lagrange equations as before, they have the same form, but now here you must use the cyclic reordering in the, in the definition of the derivative. And then you have the, uh, the, the, the momenta that are defined in this way because they are inspired by this part here of the Euler-Lagrange equation, the deformed Hamiltonian and the Hamilton equations can be derived formally in an analogous way of what we have done in the classical case. Uh, analogously, you can define this star Poisson bracket, and you will have star canonical transformation, okay? Uh, you can show that this kind of transformations defined with this bracket indeed preserve these star commutation relations between the canonical variables. So you can call them canonical transformations in the sense that they preserve the, the basic uh, canonical brackets. And uh, you can investigate what are the symmetries of your deformed theory. Again, you can try with this kind of generator and uh, you proceed by steps that are quite analogous with uh, cyclic uh, right and left derivatives and, and, uh, and star wedge products. At the end, you find that these are the conditions. And it formally, they look exactly like the conditions that I found before, but now you have this deformed Poisson form commutator. 
uh, Poisson bracket. Now, this whole program, now I will apply to the deformed gravity theory that uh, we constructed together with Paolo uh, many years ago. And I want to see if in this case, in, for example, it reproduces the correct transformations of the fields that leave the deformed action invariant, okay? Now, these transformations I already know because in the Lagrangian language, I can very easily find what are the transformations on the basic fields that leave the Lagrangian invariant. And we found that these transformations were, okay, the usual diffeomorphism because everything is written in geometric language, but also an extension and a, if you want a deformation of the Lorentz symmetry to a bigger symmetry, with a generator more, GL2C, a star GL2C symmetry. Now we will see what it is. Now, uh, we have seen the classical action. Now, as a technical trick, I rewrite this classical action, einstein hilbert action, in an index-free way using this uh, gamma matrix expansion. I mean, it's a Clifford representation of the fields uh, VA gamma A instead of, of VA, et cetera. Now, if you take these gamma matrices, you plug them uh, inside and you take the trace, you obtain exactly this action. This is just a quicker way to write things. And uh, this quicker way to write things allows me to see immediately what uh, are the local Lorentz rotations uh, that leave invariant these, these action. You see, since V transforms with this commutator, omega transforms with the commutator with the gauge parameter and an inhomogeneous piece, but omega is not present here. It is present only through R and R is really a commutator with epsilon. So you see that everything transforms with the commutator. So if epsilon commutes with this gamma five, then the whole action is invariant. And indeed epsilon commutes with gamma five because epsilon contains as a parameter only gamma AB matrices. Okay, so this is a blitz way to see the invariance of the, of the uh, action for einstein hilbert uh, gravity. Now, this I mentioned just to prepare it for the deformation uh, with uh, star products. And the deformation with star products uh, proceeds along exactly the same lines. But now, now the, yes, thank you. Sorry, R. What what is broken? Sorry, I didn't hear. Ah, no, no, it's it's not broken at all because uh, because this is still a D form integrated into a, a D dimensional manifold, so it is still invariant under uh, diffeomorphism. No, it does not. It does not. It does not. Right. But this is a D form. This is the integral of a D form on a D manifold. And an infinitesimal diffeomorphism acts via the lead derivative. If you take the lead derivative of this trace here, you take the lead derivative, you have a piece that is a total derivative that you integrate out if you're a boundary. Well, if, if you have a, either no boundary or appropriate boundary conditions. And uh, then you have the D on this, the contraction, okay, times the derivative of a four form. But the derivative of four form is a five form, which is zero, yes. Sorry? No, because uh, yes, yes, of course it, it, it acts also on this, but you can see the whole thing as a package. Here, this is a D form package, okay, a four form in this case. You have a four form integrated on a, a four dimensional manifold, okay? Yes. Right. 
Here you don't have the whole city wall. Yes. Broken by boundaries. Uh, yes, one, one thing, add, add a few things here. Uh, if this issue makes you uncomfortable, then what we can do and what we have done is to use the cyber quit uh, map and everything becomes when you expand it into, into the deformation parameter, everything becomes at that stage, simply a deformation of the usual Einstein Hilbert action plus integrals that indeed are explicitly deformosity invariant because they involve only the classical fields and classical wedge products. So at the end, when you do computations, you have really a diffeomorphism invariant theory in the sense that the action is a sum of pieces that are all invariant under diffeomorphism. But here I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, using the cyber written map. Okay, these are the, this is the star gauge in, in variance. And the star gauge invariance, now we must be careful. We cannot have uh, omega just uh, as gamma AB because this omega wedge star omega contains not only commutators of these generators, but also anti-commutators, like it always happens with star products. And then the anti-commutators introduce uh, one matrix under gamma phi, which you introduce here, also in the gauge parameter for the same reasons V must be supplemented by an extra field, V tilde, which is uh, the gamma A, gamma five part. And this is the part of the curvature. You plug in these equations in uh, these uh, definitions here in these variational equ in these uh, equations that give the variations. And what you get, uh, you can uh, rewrite the action in components with this V and V tilde fields. And this is the non-commutative field bind gravity action in components with these extra fields that you, you have introduced. These are the curvatures. And at the end, these are the gauge variations that you obtain from these very simple formulations by plugging in the gamma matrix expansion of these fields. Okay. In the omega field, you have this omega AB. And then the omega and omega tilde are the parts that are proportional to the matrices one and gamma phi. These are all four dimensional matrices and you take the trace afterwards in the action. It is an extension, yes. But it has the correct uh, classical limit because we can impose some uh, uh, reality conditions on the fields and the theta zero limit, for example, with V tilde, you can show that it is zero and so on. But uh, these are not discussing. The gauge invariance is there. And uh, it is a uh, gauge invariance uh, that uh, takes Lorentz and deforms it into a GL2C in the sense that these are the generators of, uh, of, the, of this gauge invariance. These generators close on the GL2C algebra but when you introduce parameters, the, composite, the, the commutator of two such transformations is, is, is given by the transformations with the composite uh, parameter, which is not the usual commutator, but is the star commutators between the epsilon. In this sense, it is a star GL2C. Okay. 
okay? And so this is the result. And this is all Lagrangian uh, treatment. Now I do the Hamiltonian treatment. Suppose I do not know anything about symmetries. I just have the Lagrangian and I want to deduce what are the symmetries of the theory of which I know the Lagrangian. And I implement now uh, my Hamiltonian algorithm. Then I do this uh, Legendre transformation non commutative. I find the momenta of all these fields. The usual fields are VA and omega AB. And then you have these extra three fields that I have introduced in the non commutative version. Uh, you write down PQ dot minus L. Okay, it's a bit longer than in the classical case, but, but you, you just do it. And then you construct the gate generators via the same algorithm that I described before. And you end up indeed with a gate generator, which is this one. And now you can try. I apply this gate generator with the form bracket deformed in the way that I said before. And indeed, you recover exactly the same variation for the basic fields. So this is a good test that the algorithm is, uh, is working for deformed theories with a twist. They reproduce exactly the gauge variations that I had from the Lagrangian analysis. But now, having a canonical gauge generator, you are able to find the transformations also on the momenta, right? Before, you could not do it because you had only uh, in the Lagrangian the basic fields. If you want the coordinates, you didn't have the momenta. Now I have the momenta and I find. By, ver by using the same generator that I wrote before, you, you find also the variation on the pies. Okay, so this is more or less what I wanted to say. It brings me to the conclusion. As I was saying before, this covariant Hamiltonian formalism is not equivalent to the usual Hamiltonian formalism where you single out a particular direction. Now, uh, the momenta are two forms, right? Uh, they are not uh, zero forms like in the usual canonical formalism. But the form e Hamilton equations are equivalent to the uh, Euler Lagrange equations. So both, these uh, both the canonical schemes that, uh, well, this, canonic this geometrical scheme and the usual canonical uh, uh, scheme describe the same classical theory. It is the same classical theory, even if the canonical form is, is different. It's the same classical theory because the form equations, the Hamilton equations there that I obtain are exactly equivalent to the euler lagrange equations. But we know that quantizing the theory may be uh, the, the Hamilton framework you are using may be crucial for the quantization. And you can have more than one way to canonically quantize a theory. And, and here I'm presenting a, an alternative, a possible alternative way of quantizing it via canonical quantization. So the next homework that I should do, that uh, I will try to do in the next months is to do the quantization within the classical covariant Hamiltonian formalism, right? To see how you can quantize it with this new definition of moment. Uh, the second part of the homework will be also to have a look at Young Mills. And the third part and more ambitious part of, of this homework, more ambitious because I'm not expecting that uh, this new geometrical Hamiltonian uh, framework will resolve the fundamental problems of quantization of gravity theories, which are non renormalizability and non finiteness of the theory, right? But star deformations have as basic motivation also the one of trying to provide or at least to suggest a regularization scheme for divergent theories right and so this whole scheme makes it 
would make sense, in my opinion, to apply it to star deformed gravity, where now the quantization occurs not by rewriting the action of star deformed gravity in terms of classical fields and then applying the usual canonical uh, quantization that we all have studied in textbooks, but applying this star quantization scheme that I have described, okay? So this is uh, the, the ambitious program that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to realize in, and present maybe in the next Corfu meeting. Thank you. Questions, uh, further questions, please. The standard differential equation, say for a massive scalar field, I think they are replaced here by some zero differential operator. They understand correctly. Right? Some, some operator with a lot of derivatives. Yes. Do they allow you to compute in and out fields and scattering? Is there some sense of globally hyperbolic systems and how do I define in and out fields? In principle, yes, you have a higher derivative theory and you compute uh, propagators from uh, the quadratic term in, in derivatives and the higher, the higher derivative gives you just vertices with uh, momenta. You need the relief function. Yes. In states and out states, you can't have a type formula for scattering, that I know. Or epstein glass or something. Yes. But with this higher derivatives, you're, you're getting, I think, one is getting some zero differential operator of high order. So it's just, uh, I think, yeah. And then oh, right. that theory must be quite different. I agree. Maybe, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Just a question, I don't know. Is there CPT? Is there? Is there CPT invariance in these models? I don't know. CPT, uh, well, maybe yes. Well, I would have to think about this, but why should it be broken, CPT? Why should CPT be broken by higher derivative? Not next. CPT is broken. There is a somewhat serious problem with scattering theory, which is discussed already in the Bogandigo of part of C theory book. Bogandigo of Yogunov, Salkelis, Ivan Sodorov, and so on. Right? The problem is that uh, the in and out states, even if you have some asymptotic states, they are a priori in general different Hilbert states. So you can't take scalar products. CPT is a, it is symmetry, it maps with an operator in a given Hilbert space and it intertwines, so it maps in state out states. So one can take scalar products. But without CPT, there is, at least I know, no way of identifying the in Hilbert space with the out Hilbert space. Hmm? Sorry? Anyway, this may be a super problem. Yes. But it's, it's very interesting, the idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on this point that the canonical commutation relations are different? So well, they are different in the sense they the are uh, relations between objects that are different from the classical objects, right? The classical objects are, are zero forms. The momenta here are two forms. So these momenta have an index that relates them to the basic field. And then they have an antisymmetric pair of indices, mu nu, dx mu, dx mu. So you see, the, the tensor structure of the object is different. So I, I would guess it is not equivalent. 
as a canonical scheme. Have you tried to put the master key in the game and what can we do to speak up? Speak up for Hello? Have you tried to put matter fields in the game? Uh, now, in the classical part, yes, we have developed this theory with Paolo uh, by coupling it immediately to Fermi, to Fermi fields. To spin one half, spin three half for the generalization to supergravity and also to scalar fields. So we have done it uh, classically. There is no reason why it cannot be done by exactly the same way. I mean, yes. If there are no other questions or comments, let's uh, thank the speaker again. And uh, if this is the closure, I would like to thank George and Costas, uh, that are the organizer that took uh, the, the local, the global and the local organizers, let's say, together also with the uh, Iphigenia that is uh, our sect. And of course, all the participants. Thank you. Well, uh, let me say two words too, in addition to what uh, Paolo said. I believe we had a very successful meeting once more uh, in Corfu. Our non commutative uh, meeting was very successful. And uh, a clear signal of that is your participation till the last moment. Apart from few people uh, who had to leave for teaching reasons and so on, you are all here. That's great. Uh, I think we had excellent talks, uh, critical questions. Pal was always at the beginning and at the end of the questions, which were extended uh, uh, not only inside but outside. And uh, we extended uh, uh, existing collaborations, uh, built up uh, new collaborations. And I think these are the ingredients of uh, very successful uh, uh, meetings. Uh, so uh, I would like uh, with names to thank uh, all organizers from Postas Anastopoulos, Paula Skeri, Kavai, Pedro uh, Lelizzi, Dissimura, O'Connor, Steinacher, uh, uh, Zabo, Ritsa Starova, Tamura, and uh, okay, I don't uh, thank myself. <laughs> and uh, uh, those who helped a lot, uh, you have seen them around, uh, was Costas uh, Anagnostopoulos, uh, Stelio Stefas, and Jai uh, uh, Taylor. They helped a lot in the uh, organization. So let's them uh, all of them again. Uh, special thanks are uh, uh, due to uh, Iphigenia, our secretary, who has done a lot of work. And uh, let me uh, remind you once more that um, uh, next year, hopefully, uh, the construction of these buildings uh, will finish and uh, will not disturb us anymore. <laughs> the constructors will not disturb us, but they will offer the uh, hosting that we were expecting since uh, many years. Uh, to do that, we would like to have your support. So we started uh, the organizers who we are uh, locally uh, here, uh, some discussion for next year's meeting, and we would like uh, to ask for your support. We need your presence also next year in order to convince local authorities that we are a very active community and we need these buildings to do science also in the future. So I need that from your side. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice and uh, safe trip back.